Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're here on Think Tech, and this is uh, Bigotry in America, and we're talking today about the Holocaust at Passover, which starts actually tomorrow, and the uh, question of the day is, is it being forgotten? Um, and Peter Hoffenberg is with us. Uh, he's been here before. He's a professor at the university. He's also Jewish. You have to, you have to crank that in. <laughs> and he is speaking in his individual capacity, not as a representative of the university or anybody else. Yeah. Right, or any Jewish organization. Yeah. Right, yeah, good. Thank you. All right. First, I want to I say why I'm wearing this. I just came back from the legislature at a run because they spent the last couple of hours dealing with uh, the, the Death with Dignity Medical Aid and Dying Bill, which has been in and out of the legislature for like 20 years. And after a Herculean effort this year, well, last year and this year, um, they passed it, uh, 23 out of 25 senators voted against it. A couple of three of them voted, uh, you know, uh, I mean, 23 out of 25 voted for it. Okay. A couple of the ones who voted for it voted with reservations, and they took a long time to express the reservations. And, um, but after all of that, uh, 23 out of 25 passed it, and David Ige has said that he will sign it upon presentation. So we now, effectively, within a few weeks, we will have this law, this new law, this new progressive law, happy to say, uh, death with dignity or medical aid and dying. This is a good thing, and I'm fresh from it. I'm very excited. What you have here is a scoop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not what we're here to discuss, though, Peter. <laughs> right, but I will have reservations about everything I say, too, so it's a good, it's a good lead in, right? <laughs> You're not running for office, are you? No, from no, Good move. From okay, office. There it is. Right. <laughs> so our topic today is the Holocaust at Passover. Uh, is it being forgotten? And there's two things I'd like to sort of set the stage with. One is Passover starts tomorrow. The first Seder night is tomorrow night. And uh, we can talk about the story of Passover. I think that's important. People hear that. But, but also um, a, a piece that appeared in this morning, New York Times, an op-ed piece by uh, a rabbi in Los Angeles. And uh, he spoke about how, uh, how uh, um, the Jewish religion has been essentially forgotten in large part around the world since World War II, since the Holocaust. Uh, and, you know, you can find synagogues um, all over the world that are effectively non-functioning. They have become auditoriums, they have become museums, uh, or they have become synagogues that don't, don't have an, a minion, which is, a, uh, you know, ten people to actually pray together. Um, and uh, the, the ghosts, he, he, called the, he called it the ghosts the ghosts of Judaism around the world in so many cities. It's not just in Europe where the Holocaust took place, but it's in Asia, it's everywhere. These, these temples used to be so vibrant and everything, and now they're ghosts. Um, they're a very interesting piece, if you get a chance to see like it, to, in the New York Thank Times. Thank you for yeah. me to it. So anyway, uh, that, that sets the stage, and I guess I'm, I'm really wondering where we are here in 2018 on Passover, and like you described the story of that, uh, and, and where Judaism is, and especially where anti-Semitism anti is in 2018. Is that a multiple compound uh, uh, question? Well, that should take several Passovers. I think that's <laughs> Passover plus, plus Hanukkah and every other holiday. So where, where would you like to begin? It's up entirely well, up to you. Let's Your begin goal. with the story of Passover. Okay. Well, I think um, most uh, folks, particularly in the Islamic and Christian worlds, know about the story of Passover. Uh, they certainly read uh, the biblical accounts and such about uh, the Jews uh, living in Egypt, or what was Egypt, um, having been um, invited and living there um, under relatively uh, good terms. And it's a somewhat classic story where an immigrant group, in this case Jews, are invited. Uh, they live decently, um, not first-class citizens, but decently. And then there's a political regime change. And that certainly is relevant today for immigrants who were invited somewhere and lived, and then the politics changed. And the Jews, as is, is uh, the wording, uh, now live under uh, a pharaoh uh, who did not really know them. And so in very briefly, I think the story for folks is that um, Moses at the center um, leads uh, rebellion against what was slavery. Uh, negotiates. You can think Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner, as people of sure. our generation the great Hollywood would think movies, of it, yeah. right? Uh, would think of negotiating uh, for freedom, and again, uh, in a not unique situation, uh, the options uh, are between uh, continuing as slaves or essentially leaving. And so, again, I think people 
would resonate with that today. You stay and have not, no freedom or you leave. And uh, we wander uh, for 40 years through the desert, which is one of the reasons that some of us Jews do not like to camp, because that was not a particularly <laughs> good camping experience. And we'll probably talk about the other, the second major camping experience, which was also not a particularly good one. Uh, after fleeing uh, the Pharaoh's troops, a series of plagues, of course, they wander for 40 years and then enter the promised land. And so I think if you are living uh, next to a Jewish family or uh, you know Jewish people, you'll see us uh, suffering under matzah, which is unleavened bread because we had to flee before we could leaven the bread, uh, which means all uh, gastroenterologists will be particularly busy this week and next week and we'll try to recover. Uh, we have a, a ceremonial meal which honors the experience such as the uh, the mortar used to build the bricks, built as slaves. Uh, it resonates with spring, so you'll have Paschal lamb, etc. Of course, uh, the Last Supper was a Seder, so if one follows the life of Jesus. So I think this is one of the holidays which is probably most well known among non-Jews. Well, a lot of it is the story, uh, the story winding up in Canaan uh, after 40 years. And Canaan is the modern day Israel, isn't it? Um, so there's a big Israel factor in this. Next year in Jerusalem, um, that's been Very you know so. the, the, the mantra for what five thousand years, um, and so this is a story with lots of parts, but very memorable, and it's a story because of the Seder where you get to tell the story in some detail with iconic, you know, food and things, you know, iconic pieces on the table that connect up with the meal. So the result is that even if you're a kid, you wind up, you, you, you walk out of that Seder knowing a little history and remembering it and reinforcing it every single year of your life. Right. Well, the understanding is uh, to somewhat uh, bridge history and space. I would say it's our transubstantiation. So there are Roman <laughs> Catholics out there, right. they can understand. Because at some point during the Seder, uh, everybody who is attending the Seder, reading or listening, is supposed to feel as if they were there. So it's not just the story, but it's actually the retelling of the story, and the retelling of the story in essentially the same order. So one could go and uh, read Haggadah, Haggadot, which is the prayer book for the, the Seders, in the medieval times, and one would find the story essentially the same as what one would get off of the web today. So it is the story, but it also is the telling of the story in a particular way, and the repeating of the story in a particular way. And the songs, and the litany. Of songs, of course. I mean, this is the same, the same prayers, the same songs, the exactly. same inquiries, you know, year after year through your life, and the lives of untold millennia, you know, I mean, untold generations in, in millennia after right. millennia. So it, it really does leave an impression. I can't think of any other part, <clears throat> really, of the Jewish religion or any religion where, you know, you are exposed to such detail about that event, and any event like that, on a repeated basis. And yes, I agree with you, you're there. The, the, whole, the whole experience puts you there, and thus you remember it, and, and, and you incorporate it into your worldview. Right. I, do, so, I do, I tell you that. So you can see how very important it became um, in American history, uh, particularly in African American history. So slavery, telling the stories of slavery, telling the stories of wandering. Uh, uh, black America had its Moses characters, and very importantly for Moses, and again, folks who um, saw the movie, or read, uh, the Torah, or the Bible, as it might be called, uh, will understand that uh, Moses uh, committed sin, and because he committed a sin, he was not allowed to go into the Promised yeah, Land. Right. So you can see it resonates in a very tragic way with somebody like uh, MLK Jr., or Malcolm, or Frederick Douglass, who were major figures leading African Americans out of enslavement, who didn't, who never, uh, we haven't really reached the promised land, yeah. of course, as far as racial, equ racial equality, but that, that resonated with the, the Moses story. So it's Joshua, of course, who leads the people and the tribes into the promised land. But you could say this, this is a condition of humanity, that uh, humanity is always seeking freedom. And so the Passover story remains relevant, sometimes even more relevant than before. Uh, with not only the Jews, but really a lot of people in the world who seek freedom. Yeah. I think they, they seek freedom, and we could have a philosophical discussion the next time around. But that would be right. right. I, I, I think uh, freedom 
is the noble idea. I think probably if we scratch the surface, unfortunately, most people pre prefer, prefer order and stability. And that's part of the tension here, right? Yeah. Because there were also Jews who would not go with Moses. And as Jews wandered the 40 years in the desert, there were those who became nostalgic for Egypt. Even though Egypt was enslavement, Egypt was what they knew. Egypt was order. So those, of, those folks who may not even be interested in religion can see this fundamental human tension between, as you say, freedom, either individual or corporate, but also the drive uh, to have stability and order. So one of the great tensions in those 40 years, and you can see this with immigrants everywhere, right? Do, I'm not going to risk because freedom is uncertainty, freedom is difficult. Rousseau said freedom is easy to swallow, difficult to digest. <laughs> and Egypt, or where you came from, is what you knew. Let's remember tragically that there were, it's not a large number of people, but, it's, but not an insignificant number of people who uh, moved from Europe to North America and then moved back to Europe in the 30s. In part, because it's a bad time. No, to it's back. Uh, you can't think of a worse time. You really cannot think of a worse time. And there were a variety of reasons, but among those was uh, the intense American anti-Semitism in the 1930s. Yeah. Father Coughlin and such an intense yeah. and economic difficulties, and they had family back in Europe, and they knew Europe. Uh, it's one thing, you know. Uh, European anti-Semitism was known. You knew, you knew how to operate among, until the Nazis rose, of course. <laughs> then but, but the standard yeah. European, the expected European anti-Semitism uh, was uh, horrific. Uh, but uh, many folks were able to negotiate, because it wasn't genocidal anti-Semitism. I mean, Nazis were genocidal. They you can't negotiate step. with that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, not being able, perhaps, to live in a particular area or not being able to be in a particular profession uh, was something that Jews and other minority groups have lived with forever, yeah. but having everything stolen, your children murdered, that, of course, was uh, beyond the pale, uh, but also something that most people in the 1930s um, had no recognition of. So the folks who moved back, you know, moved back with uh, incomplete or no knowledge. It's not, it's not a moth going to a flame. Um, it's just the, America wasn't the promised land. Yeah, and, and they... Um, when they moved back, um, there were not that many of them. I mean, this was not no. a grand movement. No, it's back. not. But it's, um, you know, we always debate about numbers and how representative. Sure. Uh, but it's it's not insignificant. Yeah. yeah. Um, and certainly, um, many most of them perished. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Were murdered. That was that yeah. was that one of those really bad mistakes. Right. So uh, compressing, you know, mm -hmm. five thousand years of history. Um, you know, after they got to Canaan, after Passover, uh, there was the diaspora, and the diaspora in large part was successful. I mean, the Jews flourished in many places in the world. Yes, there was anti-Semitism, but it was, in, in a lot of places, it was bad, but manageable. In some places, it wasn't so bad, and they flourished as part of the local community and culture and all that. Um, but the war, the war and, and the Nazism really changed that. And the peace in the times, you know, st stand for the proposition where there were people, lots of people practicing their religion in so many cities. Now that's not the case. And now, furthermore, we have, I'm just reading the paper mm -hmm. here, we have, we have a resurgence of anti-Semitism. So right after this break, I would like to discuss with you the title question of our show, which is the Holocaust at Passover, uh, is it, and it refers to, I guess, the Holocaust, mm -hmm. is it being forgotten? Are we forgetting the Holocaust? Should we remember? Should we say never again and always remember? Or is it okay to, to forget it? And in fact, um, whether we say okay or not, is it being <laughs> forgotten? We'll be right back okay, after this time break. To think about Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. 
I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Peter Hoffenberg. You can call him professor. He doesn't speak to the university, but he has a lot of ideas. He's a history professor. Actually, I really care about history a lot. <laughs> you know, I don't think you can appreciate anything, much less the present, the future, anything without understanding history. And today we're talking about the history of, of Passover. We're talking about the Holocaust and the, and the connection between the Holocaust and Passover starting tomorrow. Um, and is, is the Holocaust being forgotten? So, you know, I, I put that question to you. You know, the Passover is supposed to help us remember the hard times in Egypt. And in remembering, maybe, I don't know, there's something bittersweet about it. It brings us together as a community. It makes us understand the human condition maybe a little better. And it makes us, uh, you know, connect with Judaism, I suppose. Um, but, but, but what's the role of the Holocaust? And in the, in the, the Passover uh, Haggadah, um, there's, in the ones I've seen, always references to the Holocaust, which is, you know, happened a long time after Egypt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but why is that? What's the connection between Passover and the Holocaust? Superb question and many answers. <laughs> well, okay. As we say, right, two Jews, three opinions. So <laughs> let me give you six. Uh, let, me, let me start from the middle and develop out. The middle argues that this was a unique event and not unique at the same time. And I think that's part of the tension. And what I mean by that is not that the Holocaust is being forgotten, but the Holocaust is either being normalized, mm -hmm. so if we use the word genocide, it's one more genocide, or the Holocaust is being compared to other things, and inevitably when we make a comparison, we say one is stronger, weaker, one is more significant or not. So Yehuda Bauer, uh, a dear friend and really uh, the head rabbi of Holocaust studies, uh, doesn't use the word unique. Uh, what he says is the Holocaust was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And in saying unprecedented, that does not mean that other genocides or other mass murders, it does not mean that the experience of transatlantic slavery is better or worse. These are essentially events that stand on their own. So to answer your question, I don't think the Holocaust is being forgotten. I think it's being used and abused. So for example, people calling the Israelis Nazis or calling ah, Netanyahu yeah. Hitler. So that's an abuse. The height of irony. Right. But also it's being, in a certain degree, normalized. All of history is filled with this. This is one example. And then uh, I certainly do not want to uh, offend in any way any of your listeners, uh, but in the West, um, it's become a certain degree uh, a Christian moment where I have read materials that equate uh, the death of Jews, the murder of Jews in Auschwitz with the crucifixion. There were uh, post-visit surveys at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C and many of the high school kids came out, came out saying they now understand Jesus better. So what's happening is it's not so much a Jewish event, and it's not so much an event which stands on its own. So I wouldn't exactly say forgotten. I would say relativized, normalized. Uh, it would be a, as if you took an event like Atlantic slavery and removed the overwhelming fact that those were black Africans who were enslaved and used it as a discussion of other forms of slavery in which slavery is a widespread issue, and this is just one example, rather than recognizing the horrors of 20 million people ripped from the continent of Africa under beyond inhumane conditions. So I don't mean to be overly professorial with you, but it's a, it's a really good question because there are curricula, which include the Holocaust, there's a Holocaust Remembrance Day, there's Yom HaShoah, but by the same token... That, that's a day dedicated to the Right, Holocaust. so they're very different. So yeah. Holocaust Remembrance Day, for example, is a day where we talk about the relationship between, um, between and among genocides, 
Uh, there's usually a mayor or a governor who says it's Holocaust Remembrance Day. And it's a, a, com it's a community, a little bit of a community kumbaya moment. Well, you what show community are we speaking about? The Jewish wherever community? you live. No, I mean, wherever you live. Okay. It's sort of the community gets together and uh, well-intentioned individuals who are very well-intentioned, have good hearts, um, uh, feel badly about it, promise never to let it happen again. Uh, and that's a community as in state, a political community, neighborly community. Uh, but in the Jewish community is Yom HaShoah. And that's the day where, you know, if you're in Israel, everything stops. People get out of their cars. It's like in Europe after the First World War, 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month, still to this day. So if any of your viewers want to catch a bus at 11 a.m. on November 11th in London, you're not going to catch that bus. Really? If you want to cash your check in Berlin, you're not going to cash that wow, check. Wow, how interesting. It's a day, it's a moment of remembrance. remembrance. But particularly by and among, you know, originally veterans and now children and grandchildren, etc. So we here also will have a Yom HaShoah service on April 11th. The goal of that is to remember uh, those who both were murdered but also escaped or survived. Because their memory, the memory of the escapees and the memory of the children of survivors, those are valuable memories. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the last survivor passing away. Like la two years ago, the last American veteran of the First World War passed away. But it's not as if uh, their children or their community don't still have control over the memory and control over the stories and narratives. So uh, you ask a, a very important question. Um, I would say, no, it's not being forgotten. But it is being modified and tweaked and used and relativized, and sometimes used to hit Jews over the head with, or oh, Israel over, I've the, had that over the head with. Yeah. Right, right. Wow. So I don't, does that answer? I hope. Yeah, it helps. but I, you know, I yeah. want to go a little further. Please with do. It. You know, every, I want to, every answer should have a couple questions. Of course, it's the yes. sausage theory. Go from link to link. Right, it's kosher. This is Talmudic, <laughs> Talmudic sausages. Yeah. So uh, back to the New York Times article, right. um, and uh, you know, fewer and fewer synagogues, and uh, a lot of assimilation, a lot mm -hmm. of assimilation, and and and, and perhaps uh, you know, here in Hawaii, there's a certain amount of Jewish education. That doesn't mean there's a lot of Jewish education everywhere. In fact, I would say there isn't. It's and it's declining. There are other things you you want to do in your life, and that's just not one of them. At the same time, you have an increase, and in, I'm only reading the Times in uh, in uh, anti-Semitism, and recently in the South. Of France, a, uh, an 85-year-old woman was attacked in her home and stabbed 11 times because she was Jewish, um, and that's rampant. Uh, oh, and the, the body was burned. And the, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. B bottom line is we have some pretty gross anti-Semitism going, and against a backdrop of the Holocaust didn't take place, the Jews are lying about the Holocaust. Uh, they're making it up. Um, and there are people, Peter, you know this, who believe that right now, today. People in this country, people in our educational system, they believe it's all made up. So uh, you can say that the people around the, the Passover Seder, they remember. You can say the community, the, the, you know, the, 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 the common good kind of community, people who care, moderate kind people, they remember. But, but the larger community and the country and the world, are they, do they remember? Well, I think the, the two main claims you're making uh, need not be causal. So in other words, you can remember the Holocaust and remain a virulent anti-Semite. They're not mutually exclusive. And I think that's one of the things that the Jewish community has to recognize, that anti-Semitism, noting anti-Semitism, honoring our dead, honoring the Holocaust, is in fact not necessarily going to dilute or reduce anti-Semitism. I mean, it's connected to Israel. Uh, an argument is often made that uh, Israeli policies are uh, resulting in anti-Semitism, what's sometimes called the new anti-Semitism. <laughs> now, you know, that may or may not be, but that puts the Palestinians and Israel as little chess pieces. And I can promise you, I will give you my mint Mickey Mantle rookie card. <laughs> that if Israel were to stop doing many of the really illegal and unacceptable things to some Palestinians, there would still be plenty of anti-Semitism. I'm with you. So if people, I, mean, I don't people have a Mickey about, Mantle card, but right? I'm with you. So people care about the Palestinians, just care about them as human beings. 
don't connect it to somehow anti-Semitism. And we have to care about the Holocaust and not, we also can't expect that our discussion of the Holocaust will somehow make people hate Jews less. The Germans and the Austrians, for example, are experiencing this by outlawing Holocaust denial. It has not, it has not removed anti-Semitism. Uh, the Nazi party is illegal in Germany. The fascist party is illegal in Italy. Both of them <coughs> have now been redressed up and both of those have candidates. Uh, I, got, uh, I got two more questions. Sure. I don't know if we can fit them in. I'll come back. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, this is an exist, what Robert Westrick calls the longest hatred. This will continue yeah. well after our discussion yeah, today. That, and that's, yeah, that's it. Uh, you know what I, gee, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about next time, sure. okay? Sure, sure. Next time, Peter, I'd like to talk about where this, this global anti-Semitism came from, why? It's, you know, you and me, we're ordinary people, the Jews are ordinary people that try hard to live and have families and do right in the world, and they have a rich, you know, heritage of, of all of that. And why is it that in every age and every generation, I'm taking this out of this, mm -hmm. the, the Passover, Haggadah, every age and every generation, we suffer this kind of anti-Semitism. Even now, even after the, you know, the, the horror of World War II, people really still do it. Uh, and I find that kind of extraordinary a flaw in humanity, if you will. Um, and I wonder, and, and we can talk about this next time, I think of those guys emerging out of the Warsaw Ghetto, the ones who said, never again, I am not going to tolerate this again, the ones who fought in the war of 1948 vigorously in order to save Ju 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 Judaism, in order to save Israel. And um, where are they now? Do we have people, I guess we do, uh, do we have people who will fight that fight? Do we have people who believe so strongly that they are, you know, they are they are a force that will stop anti-Semitism. And I'm not sure if anyone is actually advocating that, but uh, there was, remember Meyer Kahani? Of course, the JDL, of course. And he felt that you actually went out there and said never again with a, with a, with a club or a gun, he with said. With a gun, and yeah. uh, they committed violent acts uh, <laughs> in, during the crazy times of the uh, late 60s and, and early 1970s. Uh, we could talk about that. I don't advocate the JDLs. <laughs> Nor <Not> do I. <laughs> um, and, and part of anti-Semitism is the difficulty in distinguishing, if we want to make this distinction, between words and actions. And if we want to make those distinctions, so it's easy if you don't make the distinction, because then you can outlaw anything. But I think our tradition, our very valuable American tradition, is really to try to make a distinction between what you say and what you do. Yeah. But we are struggling with that intellectually. And we're struggling with not only are they separate, but uh, how do we determine when the words will lead a reasonable person to think that an action would result? It's a great challenge. It's a great challenge for the Jewish people. It's a great challenge for anybody who appears at a Seder uh, tomorrow or Saturday. And it's a great challenge for a, a history professor as well. And uh, when we come back, I also, want to, I also want to talk about Catholicism. I want to talk about the Inquisition. I want to talk about the king and queen, was it Ferdinand and Isabella right. in 1892, how they were treated as the most Catholic of all rulers in Europe. And what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis the Inquisition? Ooh, what a well, question. so whet your appetite. You yeah. may or may not know this, uh, but Benjamin Netanyahu's brother, of course, was the only Israeli killed in Entebbe. And that influences him tremendously for a variety of reasons we can talk about. His father was a well-known professor at Cornell who wrote a book about the length of at least three books in the Torah saying that the Inquisition was essentially the dress rehearsal for the Shoah. Oh my God. So there's a lot, and this is not necessarily pick on Netanyahu, but Netanyahu may be the face, for anti-Semites certainly, Netanyahu is one of the, the faces who is targeted. And, and we can talk about Israeli politics and uh, whether some are justified or not. But, but his own fascinating life history embodies so much and explains a lot of the never again. His father linking the two, his brother dying. Uh, but having said that, he's also a pretty clever politician. Yeah. So Netanyahu <laughs> may say never again, uh, but he's on the phone with lots of different people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I mean, maybe more we... than more than happy. I'm um, happy to talk about the religious tradition. There's a biological tradition. I think uh, one of the ways for your listeners, if they're interested, to think about this is that anti-Semitism is a, 
essentially a form of racism. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. So if we look at why people are racist, we can help to begin to understand why people, except that there have also been um, Jewish institutions. But there again, black churches are targeted in the South as institutions of African American spirituality. So there are some very important uh, parallels. But I think for listeners uh, thinking about why racism arose, why we can't get rid of it, uh, how we might distinguish between racial words and racial actions also do apply. Uh, the irony is in many of these countries, um, Jews are really a relatively small minority. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and, and, and we'll connect that with uh, whether humankind is perfectible or imperfectible. If you don't okay, mind, no, that's, that, my, that's, that's my inquiry. That's only two or three minutes to <laughs> decide that. Of course, that's easy. <laughs> of course. Peter yeah. Hoffenberg, history professor at UH. Wonderful to yeah, talk thank to you. Thank you very Next much. Next time again soon. Oh, of course. As soon as you. <laughs>